live from Madrid, Spain. It's the Cube covering HPE Discover Madrid 2017. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Welcome back to HPE Discover Madrid 2017. This is the Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with my co-host Peter Burris. Jesse Saint Laurent is here. He's the CTO of Hyperconverged at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and he's joined by Jacobus Stein, who is the GM of IT operations at Key Price Insurance in yes, South sir. Africa. King Price Insurance, yeah. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you, Jesse. Good to see you again. Yeah, great to be here. What's happening at Discover? Hyperconverged, all the rage, taking I, over the world. Yeah, Hyperconverged taking over the world. I think you know, virtual machines continue to be a big challenge for customers, right? They're they're still exploding. Uh, as much as we talk about all the other cool things that are happening in the industry, like a lot of times it's the old unsolved problems that just won't go away, right? And it's funny to call VMs the old problem, but in some ways they're they're uh, they're kind of forgotten at times as we talk about next generation stuff, but. The reality is, you know, hyperconversion is still growing like crazy, still helping the customers simplify that management experience. So, for us, that's uh, you know, running on the Gen 10 platform from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, you know, just rock solid server platform. And in terms of delivering customers the same thing we've been delivering, right? Which is that predictable performance and simple management experience to, to provide IT for them. Yeah, VMware is the new legacy, and yeah. uh, <laughs> we should all have <laughs> such a legacy. Yeah. And, uh, Okay, Jacobus, let's get into it. Uh, first, first, tell us about your organization, Key Price. Yeah, so King Price is a, a short-term uh, insurance uh, company in, in South Africa. Started off about five years ago uh, by a very innovative CIO, so he's been in the insurance industry most of his life. Uh, but he, he didn't like what he was doing in the insurance industry, so he kind of like wanted to reinvent the whole insurance industry. So he came up with this one-of-a-kind business model. Uh, and our biggest selling point there is that uh, as your corp value depreciates on a monthly basis, so does your uh, insurance premium. And that is, that is our biggest selling point in, in the short term industry when it comes to vehicles. Um, and that's really been taking off in South Africa. And I was telling some other guys this morning, it's actually surprising that nobody else in, the, in South Africa has tried to copy that because it's, it's a winning model for us. Sorry, that happens monthly? Monthly, yeah, we decrease your premium on a monthly basis. You guys sell it to the so, US? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not yet, <laughs> but yeah, definitely uh, on the maps. I mean, it's so logical, right? The replacement costs are going down. But why wouldn't your premiums go down? Yeah, one would think it is quite logical. So it is, there's obviously a lot of questions, but yeah, your repair cost goes up on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, and, and the rent dollar is not always very healthy for us. Um, but I mean, we, we do all the math in the background, and it, and it, and it makes sense. Uh, it's more valuable to retain a customer on the book than having to replace a customer every five or six months. Uh, so keeping a customer on the books by decreasing its premium, in the long run, it makes a lot more so sense. So if you keep churn below a threshold and, 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 and maintain that customer relationship for a long enough period of time, you get profitable. Yeah, because I mean, in, in South Africa especially, the short-term insurance industry is extremely competitive. Um, so the acquisition cost of a customer is very high. Uh, we've got various forms of leads coming in via websites and partners and things like that. Um, but the price just to get a customer on the books is extremely high. So the longer a customer stays on the book, the, the, the sooner he pays off for his acquisition. Um, and that's where we actually return that into the customer. Radio ads are the big thing in the US for, I don't know if that's the case in South Africa. I mean, we've, we've tried a few radio ads. Uh, it's not. Not the main technique. No, no definitely what is, not. What is the main um, channel? Uh, so we, we are very or? big on, on social media. Mm -hmm. uh, so the one thing that we've adopted from, from the get-go was definitely technology. Uh, and that is evident in every aspect of our business. So we really push social media. We've got a whole team looking off the social media. Uh, we've got brand ambassadors working at our business. Um, we do some TV ads, uh, but again, that's, that's quite pricey. Uh, some billboards still, yeah, little radio but ads, but uh, predominantly. Social's productive then. It is. All right, let's get it. I love talking about your business, especially disruptors to the insurance business. I mean, it's just sitting there waiting to get disrupted. So let's get into the infrastructure side. Maybe you paint a picture for us. What's that look like? Yeah, so uh, when I joined the, the company about two and a half years ago, they were just starting with this whole virtualization thing, so it was kind of like new to them. Uh, having started up just five years ago, 
there was like 100 IT guys working there, but some of them were working in marketing and some of them were working in management. So it was all over the show. Uh, and my main job was actually just to consolidate in that entire environment and get them on this journey. Um, with the competitive of the market, um, it, it's really important for us to get proper product to market quickly. Um, and that's the, one of the challenges I faced from day one is that our inability to actually get product to market because of a lack of proper infrastructure, the turnaround times in getting uh, environments up and running. Uh, and it was, it was literally to the point where we were detrimental to the business. We were causing serious downtime. Business were running major losses almost on a monthly basis because systems were down, they were ill-managed. Um, and then luckily for us, uh, we came across the guys from HPE Simplivity and they came in there. We deployed some of their technology on a, on a proof of concept basis in our development space because that was our biggest burning challenge at that point. Uh, the developers shouting for environments and we just couldn't provide that. So we thought, you know what, let's invest this in a development space and see how it goes and if it works, we'll, we'll see how it goes from there. Um, I think they, they dropped three cubes there, commissioned them, started moving the, the development teams across. And uh, two months, three months later, when the guys from HPE were there to pick up their POC cubes, we just said, no way guys, where do we sign for this? <laughs> You're not taking this out of my server room. And from there, just the adoption into the production environment was so quick. We, we instantly ordered three more cubes for the production environment. So there's still that definite split between production and development. Um, and that just allowed us to actually allow the, the developers again to get almost fresh daily copies of the production environment to allow them to, to develop products, to do um, some modeling against the production environment in their own spaces. Um, and that's really lifted their performance to such an extent that um, we now got that whole uh, agile sprint running in two week cycles. Uh, so yeah. we've done some research that suggests that when you bring this kind of infrastructure into the development world, you can actually get as high as 7x productivity impro pro improvement in developers. Have you seen those kinds of jumps? Yeah, definitely. The, the one challenge that we had, so the guys from development were really trying to adopt the whole agile development methodology. Um, but again, the infrastructure was a detriment to them because they were hoping to have the environments up and running by a Tuesday morning when their sprint would start. But then two, three days later, we were still trying to restore copies of the databases onto their environments. So they ended up with three days left of their two week sprint. Um, so I mean, that alone, the fact that we can have the environments up and running within hours uh, that's definitely a major improvement for them. And mid, mid a sprint, we can actually just decommission their environment, restore it back for them. Uh, so infrastructure is no longer the showstop in a development team, and it's definitely just taken off for them. Common story, kind of land and expand, yeah. dev impact, productivity impact, how does that compare? I think it's, it is a common thread. And I think you know, one of the other things that happens typically is um, from a land and expand perspective, those first systems go in, they're for a POC, they're for a development environment, and the theory is they're isolated. And then what happens is everybody realizes that it's easier to provision, it's more agile for the development team, it's easier for IT, and suddenly the old environment just kind of atrophies, and the new environment keeps growing. So if you look at your environment, you had some traditional infrastructure within your environment, how much has that expanded versus the SimpliVity environment since you went live with SimpliVity? Yeah, we have actually, we're no longer uh, investing in that uh, portion of our infrastructure because it's, it, it's still, it's, I mean, it's good technology and it's, it's still valuable to us, but we'll just put that on a, on a normal run out. Um, things that we cannot uh, uh, get value from a SimpliVity perspective, like, uh, like I think I was telling Jesse this morning, we've got um, our, our method of contracting, because we are entirely paperless, our method of contracting is literally the call that you make to the client to close this policy deal. So that is our proof if there's a claim or whatever the case might be. So all those recordings we need to keep for seven years. So those are the type of things that we saw in an old traditional infrastructure currently because there's no deduplication there, there's no compression of any value there. So we're just shipping all that old kind of like... Pure archive. Yeah, pure archive type of uh, approach to, to that um, environment. Yeah. Did you feel like you've achieved a, a, a substantially similar operating model to what people talk about with the public cloud on-prem? On 
I think the, the, the ease of deployment and the fact that it is so, so simple. Um, I mean, the guy that's currently doing it, it's, it's one guy. So again, our team is not very big. We've got one guy looking after the entire server infrastructure environment. But the ease of deploying that and the fact that it's so simple, you can do it from, from anywhere. Um, and it's literally one or two clicks and if he's got it up and running. It's, for us, it's definitely really si very similar. I mean, that's the goal, right? I mean, yeah. That's kind of I mean, why you got into this business. Is so before the acquisition, SimpliVity's theme was to simplify IT. It, with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, it's to simplify hybrid IT. But the message and the approach hasn't, hasn't changed. You know, if we can give IT cycles back to focus on things that return value to the business, that's the goal in the end of the day, right? It, it's taking time away back from all those tasks that, you know, the classic keeping the lights on tasks, allow the business to do something productive. But it's also to make the cycles that remain that much more valuable as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, anything we can do that, that takes you know, day to day management tasks off the plate of the IT organization allows them to be that much more productive. You know, Developers having you know, their whole sprints, I mean, that's night and day in terms of productivity back to the business. In terms of the performance that, that customers see in their environment, and what you're, you have a critical nightly batch job in your environment, right? Yeah. And what was your, what yeah. was your pre and post experience there? So the one thing that we do, I mean, the monthly decrease, that's, that's a big SQL job that runs very often in our environment. So it's, it's all part of the financial billing cycles that run. So we've got this one job that runs, I, th I think it's actually on, on a weekly basis, uh, and that would kick off on a Sunday evening, and we would literally have the guys from the finance team getting up, starting the job, and sitting there waiting for 14 hours for this job to complete. Uh, number one, the environment was not very trustworthy, so they had to be up to make sure that it actually completes. And um, post or, or actually migrate, us migrating them into, onto the Simpliving environment, the guy phoned me up the next morning and said, so he got up at one, kicked off the job, and two hours later it was done. He said, something must be wrong. This, this can't be happening. <laughs> so um, that's literally, that's 12 hours safe time. The, the challenge we had there, that that job actually ran into our production environment, our, our office hours. So the, the, the effect that held, had on our entire business was just bad, bad for IT, bad rap for IT. All right, last when question. When it failed. Sorry? When it failed. Well, well <laughs> even if it ran, it ran for 14 hours, so that ran into business hours. But it wasn't it bad failed, for the business after you got to two hours. No, 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 I right. mean, that was like yeah. by three in the morning, it's, it's all sorted. Right. And even if you had the failure on the job itself, yeah. you could just rerun yeah. it like yeah. once or twice and it would still be outside business hours. Yeah. All right, last question uh, for each of you. Your respective to-dos. Jacobus, what's on your to-do list? And then Jesse, what's on HPE's HCI to-do list? You first. Yeah, so King Price is definitely uh, seriously looking at expanding internationally. Um, so what we are busy doing is to actually redesign our entire architecture, structure of our infrastructure and our network and our security. Uh, so we are busy uh, planning to deploy another active data center. We'll probably be in South Africa still, um, but to get that full value of the WAN optimization that the simplicity of uh, the compression that we can see to actually have a proper a duplicate data center up and running to ensure business continuity. Mm. Yeah, for us, you know, the, the market knows us for our product in the, in the vSphere market, in the VMware market. And the real next growth area for us is around Hyper-V. So big excitement there around seeing that market expand. We've seen a lot of excitement from customers around multi-hypervisor. That's an area both with uh, what's happening with SimpliVity from a platform perspective, as well the other, as the other technologies from Hewlett Packard Enterprise really coming together to offer that multi-cloud experience for customers. Excellent, gentlemen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It's yeah. great to thanks see you us. again, Jesse. Thank, thank you so us. much for having us. Good luck okay. going forward. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay, keep it right there, everybody. Peter and I will be back at Discover Madrid to wrap right after this short break.